Hello. Salam alaikum. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to um, share this with you. I've been really excited about this night um, ever since Hasna asked me to be involved. And um, I want to talk about, um, for Ramadan, I want to talk about the Burak. Um, so first, I just want to say I, I pray that this may be a, a blessed month for all of us and a month which brings peace and justice to our world and blessings to us all uh, on the Day of Judgment for all of humanity as well as all of creation, seen and unseen. I would also like to pray that Allah guides us to honor this land that we stand on today and to honor the Tongva, Chumash, Tataviam, and other indigenous people who cared for this place since time immemorial, and to honor the continuation of these peoples, as well as the care of this place by all who live here. Um, this land acknowledgement, I think, is a really important part of our gatherings. And um, in, in all gatherings I'm involved in, I um, really want to support that to happen more. Um, today in the LA Times, there was a beautiful um, map, that uh, interactive map that they have online that is, um, you can see place names over um, the centuries of uh, Los Angeles uh, native place names. And I, I thought this is incredible if you'd like to look that up. Um, I would also like to pray that Allah guides us to honor the first indigenous people to bring Islam to this continent, uh, those people of African origins due to the transatlantic slave trade and to pray that Allah helps us all to end the racism and abuses of settler colonialism, which still continue to harm so many lives. So today, I would like to share my fascination of many years um, with the al um, which in some depictions is a woman-headed, winged steed who took the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, on his night journey whether in body or spirit, depending on which scholarly opinion you follow, to the highest level of heaven on her back in order that he could meet with the prophets and angels and receive divine instructions to pray five times a day. So the story is very, very rich and very detailed, and I'm sure there, um, there's many things about this that are important to all of us, but I'm going to focus on the Borag tonight. Um, we inherit the Burak through a variety of powerful indigenous cultural sources that are often considered circumstantial or peripheral to the night journey. Tonight, in recognizing these sources, I would like to focus on this image of a prophetic vehicle which has taken many forms. For me, the feminine depiction of the Burak, which is popular in so many areas, including Persian miniatures, uh, Javanese glass paintings, and many other contemporary artistic forms uh, has always struck a chord. I think of her as a vehicle of transformation and a symbol of the mysteries and powers of the feminine body, emerging where sense perception and the meaning of those sensations and perceptions meet. This to me is the heart of the inner practices of mysticism. The Borog is also a symbol of paradox, and I'll come back to this, in particular, the paradox of hope emerging from difficulty. First, let us look at the Quran. Here, the name Borog and a woman's face are not mentioned. The primary mention of the night journey is found in the beginning of Surah 17, Isra, the surah called the night journey, verse 1, where it says, Glory to God who carried God's servant by night from the Masjid al-Haram, which is the mosque of Mecca, or literally the sacred mosque, to the Masjid al-Aqsa, the mosque at Jerusalem, or literally the highest or most remote mosque, whose area we blessed, that we might show him of our signs. Surely God is the all-hearing as-sami, the all-seeing, al-Basir. When the Burak herself emerges in the Hadith, 
She is described as a shining steed, smaller than a mule and larger than a donkey, that could travel as far as the eye can see in one stride. That's the speed of light. Her image expanded over time so that in a few hundred years, she became a woman-headed, winged mule, often wearing a crown with a beautiful face. For tonight's talk, I would like to share a few methods of interpretation of this image. Firstly, through the origins and some uses of the word Barak. Secondly, through comparison with other sacred traditions. And thirdly, through our collective visualizations as we sing together. First, let's approach the words borag and basir in the context of seeing the lightning. The Arabic root barq, bayreqaf, as a verb means to shine, and is based in the concept of brightness, flashing, shining, and in contemporary use is the word for electricity. As the name of this fantastic beast, the borag, it means lightning, and perhaps refers to this speed of light. Although the name Barak does not appear in the Quran, there are many instances of profound connections between light, speed, visions, symbols, signs, and the act of seeing. In Surah 75, Qiyamah, or Surah of the Resurrection, verse 7 it says, on that day when the vision is dazzled or confounded, referring to the end of the world, or qiyamat, and using the word barq for dazzled and basir for vision. Another example of this connection between the terms barq and basir is found in Surah 2, Al-Baqarah, or Surah the Cow, verse 20. The lightning well nigh takes away their sight. Whenever it gives them light, they advance therein. And whenever darkness falls around them, they stand still. And if God so willed, God could indeed take away their hearing and their sight. For verily, God has the power to will anything. A similar theme is found again in Surah 24, An-Nur, or Surah of the Light. Art thou not aware that it is God who causes the clouds to move onward, then joins them together, then piles them up in masses? until thou can see rain come forth from their midst. And God it is who sends down from the skies by degrees mountainous masses of clouds, like today, charged with hail, striking therewith whomever God wills and averting it from whoever God wills. The while the flash of God's lightning well nigh deprives humans of their sight. All three of these examples emphasize the numinous or awe-striking element of the experience of seeing lightning, where one is completely overwhelmed by the power of God. In the context of Persian poetry, specifically Persian Sufi poetry, Molana Jalaluddin Rumi and Fariduddin Attar both frequently use the term borak, with clever world wordplay to bring out shades of meaning related to images of light. In one of Attar's ghazals, he says, az ruyash dur shod. Ey ajab har zarri sadhur shod. Here, borqa, refers to the woman's full body covering with the mesh screen for her to see through, but plays on the related and alliterative word barq, to shine. One very literal translation of this poem is, the veil goes far from the sun of her face. In amazement, every atom becomes a hundred angels. This poem is a hallucinatory invocation of the beloved in the most abstract sense, a beloved who cannot be defined or named, but is a symbol of whatever or whomever invokes our strongest capacity for the love of all that is divine. Here the abstract image of a shining and covered face is amplified into an explosion of cosmic proportions and this beloved's beauty is revealed in images of hundreds of angels. In Sufi poetry like this, there's often sets 
of terms or opposites. Uh, one of them could be the atom and the sun. This uh, theme is often used to refer to the microcosm and the macrocosm. In this paradigm, every singular being has a parallel relationship with the universe so that each person may be a kind of universe in themselves. Another common set of terms with a similar meaning is the droplet and the ocean. This way of thinking sends us into contemplation of a kind of philosophical fractal where every small thing is a symbol of and connected to a greater whole. Another set of opposites here is the inner and the outer, the zahir o batin, because the inner face, which is hidden by the borqa, becomes the outer face of the sun, which everyone can see. The experience of the veil being lifted is taken out of the realm of the ordinary and into the heights of the ecstatic. A third set of opposites found in this poem is the one and the many, where the singular beloved becomes the myriad innumerable angels. Here the image of the beloved continually defies our ability to limit and define things. As an image of the divine, the beloved is infinitely complex and holds space for a multitude of specific identities. I think this poem conveys very well a similar feeling to that of the Burak story, where by some experience out of our control and beyond our preconceptions of what is possible, we are forced to recognize a higher truth. This sometimes painful but always beautiful experience results often in an expanded awareness and an intensification of hopefulness. In this way, Attar uses these images of light to symbolize sacred knowledge, or ma'rifat, becoming a vehicle of transformation for our wounded hearts. Perhaps Attar would like to invoke in each person a particular experience of their own night journey, full of hope for the unknowable future orchestrated by God alone. In the future, we may transform in so many different ways, and in this sense, allow ourselves to identify with the Borag herself, since she has been depicted in so many forms, sometimes with a camel's neck or peacock's tail, or wearing gleaming heavy silk, or speckled with deer fur spots, as in the Turkic Mirajname, written in the Sogdian or Uyghur script, and beautifully eliminated miniatures. Why not picture ourselves as various types of borogs flashing through the skies, even as we go about our daily lives, in the opportunities to share our gifts with one another and to support one another? And what if we recognize borogs in our surroundings, seeing beyond preconceptions to the possibilities for oneness, transformation, and illumination? What if the shining vehicle was a futuristic vision of our contemporary world? In verse 2435, electricity is described in terms that people 1,400 years ago would have been able to understand. God is the light of the heavens and the earth. The parable of his light is, as it were, that of a niche containing a lamp. The lamp is enclosed in glass the glass shining like a radiant star, a lamp lit from a blessed tree, an olive tree that is neither of the east nor of the west, the oil whereof is so bright that it would well nigh give light of itself even though fire had not touched it. Light upon light. God guides unto his light him, that, him or her that wills to be guided. And to this end, God propounds parables unto people since God alone has full knowledge of all things. Perhaps the shining steed is a prophecy of our contemporary space shuttles, satellites, airplanes, or even internet connectivity. I'm looking for the person I met today who works in space, um, but I don't, I'm not sure if I see her. Um, but I was excited about this part for her. Uh, <laughs> she works for NASA. Um, in the ways that these inventions have brought us greater understanding of each other, 
greater closeness, compassion, and ability to care for each other on our planet, I think they are worthy parallels. Based on the idea of the Barak traveling at the speed of light, or as fast as the eye can see, we are encouraged to recognize that time itself has different dimensions which spans the realms of this world and the akhirat, or hereafter. I have a whole lot more here, um, and I just want to check in with you all in terms of the time. Um, I, I can talk a little bit. I had some really interesting examples that I found of other Burak-like creatures, but there are so many. It's really, really incredible once you look into the kind of um, chimeric or chimeric uh, realms of our spiritual lives. Um, <laughs> But I do want to bring up, actually, the one that I didn't think of, but I, I just read about, which um, are the Hindu uh, vahanas, or mounts of the deities. Um, each of these beings, in some way, represent a trial or journey that results in spiritual progress or new knowledge. Um, there's Ganesha with the mouse. There's Shiva with the bull. Um, and the vahanas in particular often represent difficulties that through divine intervention of the writer bring hope. Um, the other example that I wanted to bring up is from uh, ancient Judaism, the Merkava mysticism, or the chariot mysticism, which seems to be a very similar image and also has some uh, linguistic relationship because the word Merkava and Borag actually have similar root word. Uh, Borag is the Beire Kaf and Merkava is uh, the Re Kaf Be. So in a different order, but um, this was the chariot that uh, Ezekiel saw in the sky. And it was made, it's a very intricate um, description that's found of of this vision that he had of these angels with four wings. The chariot itself was driven by someone with the likeness of a person. Um, the wings would connect together, and then the other wings would cover their own bodies. There were a whole other set of angels who were the fire, made of fire, that powered this chariot. Um, so, and each of these angels had four faces, a human face, a lion's face, an ox, and an eagle. Um, so I think this kind of mysticism challenges us to use our inner eye to visualize something that we thought was impossible, like Noor Jahan said. Um, there's a, a saying that I always bring up in my um, teaching singing, which is uh, the impossible possible, the possible easy, and the easy graceful. This comes from Moshe Feldenkrais. Is I think very, very helpful, practical, um, practical thing. So even if we're talking about something like mysticism, um, that seems so lofty uh, and so psychedelic or hallucinatory, that actually there is a really um, beautiful and practical process of engaging with this deep reality. Um, so I hope that in doing that, we can allow the meaning and purpose of that to transfer to us, even without analysis. So right now, I just want to ask you how you might find yourself this Ramadan um, practicing uh, meditation, in a sense. Um, I want to bring up one other word, which is related to Merkava and Borag, which is Moragebe to care for, to, to meditate. In Persian, it refers to meditation, and, and also in Arabic, to, to kind of inner caring. Um, so I just want to ask everyone to just picture for yourselves what that might be that you, you'll be attending to. Um, perhaps it relates to the trials that you faced in your own life, and how those trials can reveal new hope and possibility. So let's take a moment with that in mind to just um, silently make a doa for each other to find this inner strength.
Now we'll return to another Quranic image of seeing the light and to Rumi. In Surah 7, Al-Araf, or Surah of the Heights, verse 143, the Quran says, when Moses came to Mount Sinai at the time set by us, and his sustainer spoke unto him, he said, O my sustainer, show thyself to me that I might behold thee. Said God, never canst thou see me, however behold this mountain. If it remains firm in its place, then only then will thou see me. And as soon as his sustainer revealed the glory, God's glory to the mountain, God caused it to crumble to dust, and Moses fell down in a swoon. And when he came to himself, he said, Limitless art thou in thy glory. Unto thee do I turn in repentance, and I shall always be the first to believe in thee. In this verse, it, it uses the word tajali or radiance to refer to this um, light which is revealed, which could relate to lightning. And in one hadith, it's referred to the amount of which, the amount of the light that was revealed was less than the nail of the little finger. And just with that, the mountain fell down. So. This earth-shaking power could also be interpreted as a type of lightning. Um, and it's interesting how it speaks to our capacity to see and the limits of our human capacity to see, in this case, through the eyes of Moses. May our illuminated awareness come to us as quickly and gently as God allows in the time of the present and in the limitless eternity of the divine realms. Rumi wrote an incredible poem in the Divan Shams, which is translated here by my good friend, Dr. Fatima Keshavars. Bedidam host ra sarmast migoft balayam man, balayam man, balayam. I saw beauty host and heard her triumphant voice say, I am calamity pure calamity, nothing but calamity. Javo bash al madaz har suz is sad jan. Torao yam man, torao yam man, torao yam. Hundreds of voices responded from every corner, answering to beauty. I am yours, fully yours. No one else's but yours. Then Rumi says, you are the voice that said to Moses, I am God, the creator, the truly divine. To an nuri keba Musa hami goft, Khodayam man, Khodayam man, Khodayam. Goftam shams tabrizi kei goft, Shomayam man. Shomayam man, Shomayam. I said to Shams of Tabriz, who are you? He said, I am you, every one of you, all of you at once. So for, to end this, I would like to share um, a poem of Hafez and just include everyone to sing this and um, if you can find your, your music and poetry on the table, um, and make sure when you're done, if you're not going to keep it, to recycle it. Um, it has the lyrics on one side, and then some music on the other side. And what we're going to do is we're going to, um, we're going to sing this. We're going to sing a part of it, and let's see. the most important part that we'll repeat are the words "Baz al mat." Can everyone say that? It means it has returned. So um, we're going to sing this actually in rhythm, and maybe we can even divide the room up into halves, 
and have this half of the room first sing Bows Mad. Can we try that? Bows Mad. Even the melody kind of says we're coming back to something. Um, and then this side of the room. Ready? Bows Mad. One more time. Bows Mad. Okay, so I'm going to. Um, sing the whole poem, but I want to see if you can actually go back and forth and trade off with each other. So I'll start with you, and then I'll sing the rest of the poem and teach you that eventually. So let's try. Bozomad, Bozomad, Bozomad. Bozomad. Beautiful. Nice. Keep going and I'll sing the poem. del Hod hod e khosh khabar az tarf e sabab boz omad Boz omad Bar kish e murq e sahar naghm e Great. Yeah. Beautiful. Mojdei del kedegar baude sabo bozomad. Listen, heart, the news has arrived on the wind, the zephyr wind. Mojdei del kedegar baude sabo bozomad. Hod hode khosh khabar az tarf e saba baz amad. So here we have the hod hod, who is the hoopoo bird. Who knows the story of the Queen of Sheba and Solomon? And yeah, so it's it's kind of referring to this story. And in a way, we're bringing in the hod hod bird as our burag. So we have this flying bird with this incredible crown of colors, um, bringing this news from the Queen of Sheba, um, and then it says, Barkish e morke sahar, sing you dawn bird, nak meye davudi baz. One more time, that song of David. Kisole imane gulaz, bao de hava baz amad. So that says, um, sing that one more time so that we might um, actually. Uh, we might, the scent of the rose might drift to us one more time. Um, it's the Soleiman uh, Gol, he's speaking of the Gole Mohammedi, the pink rose that's used to make rose water. And it's kind of like his, his gesture to that. So I hope you enjoyed that. And um, you can memorize it and learn it yourself if you like. You, you can take that home. So um, thank you so much. And really such an honor to be a part of this night. And uh, looking forward to more collaborations with you all. Thank you.